welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Lewis. Um, for whatever reason, my photo's not showing up. Uh, I'll see if. Oh, no. oh okay. It's uh, hold on, Ken. I'm gonna stop share now. I'll turn your camera on, and you can see it. Will that work? No. Yeah, put the cap. Put the camera on. Yeah, it's not, it's not working. I think there's some setting that, but I won't worry about that. You guys don't want to see my face, anyways. Um, okay. So I, I uh, work um, at Red Deer County. I'll be uh, talking a little bit later about our funding programs for residents and landowners in Red Deer County. Um, so you'll be hearing more from me later. So uh, I won't belabor introductions on myself too much. Instead, I'm going to let you know about our guest, Tozo Bozik. Uh, Tozo, uh, I've known Tozo, I think, now for many, many years. Tozo has been uh, um, one of our Alberta experts in trees and in trees in agricultural lands and urban lands and everything in between for many, many years now. And we're very lucky to have him here with us tonight. Um, Tozo's currently. Um, uh, as it has a business uh, on the side of trees and helping individuals, governments, municipalities, and so on uh, with their uh, trees and, and looking after trees, planting trees, shelter belts, and so on and so forth. Uh, so tonight we're going to be talking about, um, in particular, native trees, native shelter belts, uh, um, planting a tree planting project, how to prepare the ground, etc., for your tree planting project. Uh, I think how we're going to do it is uh, if you have questions as we go, uh, either do the hand raise thing, uh, if you know where that is on the Zoom, or you can go ahead and type your question in the uh, chat section, and we will answer it uh, as we go. Um, if that gets to be too many questions or whatever, we might have to hold off till the end just so we can kind of keep things going. But uh, by all means, for now, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll try that. We'll take questions as we go. Um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Tozo and uh, let him do the screen share thing and we can get going. Thank you so much, Ken. I really appreciate that. Um, I want to thank to the uh, Red Deer County and Lalamont County to host this uh, webinar. I uh, hope you're going to enjoy it and ask lots of questions to be honest uh as ken said if you have any questions either raise the raise the, your hands and ken is going to watch on that or ask uh, or uh, a question on you know type it whatever it's easier for you um again i want to thanks uh to the red deer county for uh, hosting this webinar okay let's go let's see what now okay um can uh, a little bit mention, I have over 27 years uh, dealing with the trees and uh, I'm a forest engineer by training. Um, since 2019, I do have a, my own business. Um, two actually, the damn Yard Whispers and APS Group. And for the people who know me, that they really be always said trees are, are my, my passion and my business passion as well. Um, we offer consulting services. So I'm not one of the guys who is going to come and remove your trees. I don't, I don't have that. Uh, I we offer to the whole range of the of the services to the various clients from golf course industry, municipality, parks, uh, educational uh, institution, and so on and so forth. Um, the range of the services it's just this is only one portion of my business. We also have a business in the forestry operation, uh, renewable energy, mostly bioenergy, uh, waste management as well and a few other things as well you can go on my website come to the tree services um i come up with this actually not mine but one of my clients came to me and said Tosha, you're a forensic tree expert and uh, and when i look at the remote career all of my career people always contact me when they have a problem with the trees or what to do about the trees or something like that so i came um, he came up with that the title for as a tree expert, which I provide insurance for insurance and legal uh, legal services. I'm also qualified uh, as uh, for the tree risk hazard assessment, and I'm arborist. I'm a forest engineer. Um, I provide a service also for urban and town uh, tree services, mostly in our inventory developing the plants. I already have uh, two counties in uh, that I work in to develop the uh, county management forest management plan. I have a small town forest management plan. 
agroforestry service with natural forest management and agroforestry. So if you Google my name, you're going to probably find lots of information on what I do and, and presentations and probably go on YouTube. There's lots of information as well. Okay. I always start every presentation uh, with the key messages from you guys. Uh, develop the plan during the winter time. And I just said today we got uh, probably a foot of snow in Edmonton and it's a perfect time not to go anywhere and do, do some work at, uh, at the office and, and computer and draw the maps, collect information on the site, order the trees, budget time, make sure that you really do some little bit planning and preparation if you want to plant the trees. Understand the site requirements. There's a lot of, this is one of the most probably important things that the people really don't pay lots of attention on that site. Well, basically on your land, what you have on your land. And uh, there is a lots of things that you really have to look at. Uh, not every tree is gonna grow on every soil, unless you have a super good soil that anything what you plant is gonna grow. So you have to look what is on the land and start from there. Where is, where is the slopes, where is the exposure, where the water flows, what kind of soil and on and on. Choosing the planting stock, um, that will depend on your budget. Um, Ken is going to cover about ALUS program that provide the uh, trees uh, uh, through the subsidies from the ALUS program uh, for the native tree species. Um, and again, there is a whole range of the stock that you can choose. Uh, again, it will depend on your planting goals and objectives, but also on your budget. Um, site prep, one way or another, either you do mechanical or chemical or no site prep, uh, each of them has a consequence. Each of them requires time, so that requires equipment, it requires, requires uh, uh, maintenance as well. So you have to think about it and you have to, most of the time you have to do something about site prep. Uh, what kind of planning techniques? Basically you have a two choice manual or, or mechanicals and there is the latest newest one that people start planting the trees with the, with the drones, which is mind boggling to me. Plant trees properly. Uh, lots of people kill the trees before they even planted. They don't plant the trees properly. They plant either too deep, too shallow, under the angles, or expose the roots. And there is a whole bunch of problems uh, uh, when it comes to the tree planting. Uh, you have to understand the purpose and functions of the trees. You have to ask yourself, why do you want to plant the trees, basically? What's the purpose? What's the function? So there is a purpose is I want to beautify my yard, or I want to put a nice shelter, about, you know, protect from the, from the wind, or... I want to for eco buffer, I want to for wildlife or whatever. So there's a purpose, but there's a function. What, because those are trees will grow as they grow, they perform different functions. And those are a little bit two different things. And I'm going to talk about that. You have to have some long-term care and maintenance uh, because there's like anything else from year to year, like this year, we have a horrendous drought. And if, if you haven't um, water your trees or you didn't put the wood chips or something like that, you, your trees will suffer. Or you have also this year, huge amount of outbreaks on the various insects and diseases that just come after, the, after those trees. Uh, my biggest message to you tonight is be creative and plant as many as possible different trees and shrubs as you can. Of course, the, uh, the uh, purpose of this workshop is the native tree species. I will cover some of the non-native that is your, your, at your disposal. You might not get um, hours money for it, but you might think and considering planting. But whole purpose is a native here. But as more as possible you can plant, the better it is. That's the biggest message I want to let you guys uh, know. That because if you have a variety of the tree species, uh, your whole uh, land and your whole micro uh, ecosystem will function better and uh, and uh, and perform better than if you just have a few uh, few tree species. So um, application, uh, yeah, this is for the spring tree planting, I assume. Um, again, you, you did all of the mapping and everything else, but uh, um, here is where is application. You can go in shelter boats. You can, this is actually ready river, uh, just uh, uh, over there for the riparian planting ready. Um, if you wanna for the pollinators habitat or you wanna eco buffer, or if you wanna natural forest or you wanna wind breaks, all of those are packs, a campground, you can do this uh, spring, uh, 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 tree planting. I also give the workshop on the fall tree planting. Uh, some of the counties asked me to, to do that. It's a little bit different because it's a different, different stock, a different planting stock. Uh, but in many ways, principles are the same. Uh, this is a picture of, the, of your residence in Red Deer County of Mr. Terry Krause. 
he planted this site, I think 13 years ago, uh, as you can see it. And, uh, and there is no regular shapes. Uh, if you look on the, over there across the street, you have a one row of the spruce, or here is one row of the spruce and then shrubs. You can see here, he has a variety of the trees and, and shrub species, variety of different shapes, different sizes, different, everything is different. And this is, I always call, this is ideal. Uh, on, on this is only 10 acres and you can see if tomorrow we got the, let's say spruce uh, uh, some of the insects spruce budworm or, or spruce beetle it can wipe out all of those trees here and this person will not going to have anything for the protection if you get the same thing Perry got, gets if he has a, all of the rest of the trees is going to be there so there's no single event even a drought even a insect and disease snow that is gonna wipe out all of them, okay? Versus if you have only one or two, your chances are that much higher uh, that the other trees can be gone. And once you got a really bad disease or bad insects or, or drought or, or chemicals or whatever, all of them are gonna be gone. In this case, in, his, in Terry's case, it's not gonna be the, uh, the case. Something will survive. I, I talked to him about drought of this year and he said, Surprisingly, trees responded very, very well. And I said to him, the reason for that, because you have a multi multiple species and those species are in all self-defense, communicating to the mycorrhizae in the soil and supplement the water in the water regimes. And that, that's why they are probably doing very well in that sense. He did watering as well. So, uh, but again, it's it, the whole purpose is that, uh, um, is that multiple species. As you can see here on the further really left on the corner or, or the southwest of the corner, he had open field, he had a pasture, nothing. And he started this from scratch. And that's why I said, be creative. Doesn't need to be in the rows, doesn't need to be uh, one species. It can be different shapes, size, forms, time, everything. That's what you want. You want to have a different, uh, different uh, different than what is usual in the past. And again, here is a, here is a list of the species. Many of them are natives. Um, there is a many non-natives, many of the trees, shrubs, uh, flowering, non-flowering, uh, all, all range of the things is there. I think the total is 52 or 54 species that he planted in this 10 acres. As you can see, it's, it, and again, imagine now in the springtime, different flowering, in the summertime, different flowering, different color, or in the fall, uh, same thing when flowering, different fruits and, and, and shapes and size. And all of them are functioning differently in some aspects. If he, we need a fruit, uh, you know, that the function is to produce the fruit. If you need a shelter, there's a certain species that's gonna provide a shelter. So there is a, for his goal, variety of the goals that he has, improve the property and also have some of the, um, uh, uh, some of the uh, berries in it that he wanna use uh, uh, for himself. Uh, and again, but the functions of those trees are a little bit different. And that's what it is. The more species you have, the better it is. Um, what are the steps? Those are some of the steps uh, that you have to look when they establish any trees in the spring in nutshell. Site selection, evaluation. I'm going to talk about design, planting choice, site prep, and, and the rest of it. You're going to see, I'm going to mention that. So, for the site evaluation, it's basically your land. You have to really a little bit spend time and say, okay, what are the prevailing winds and directions and behaviors? If you live there for 20, 30 years, you will know that. If you just move there and try to figure out, there is so many tools that you can really uh, figure out what is the prevailing winds and direction and behaviors. How, when you get snow, how much snow, where is rain, how much, uh, where is the more sleep time, you know, uh, stronger wind or, or where is the sun exposure and on and on. The second thing, what you have to do with space. People sometimes forget that trees do grow and they grow fast. And suddenly you planted the trees too close to your barn or home or fence or grain bin or storage. And then became a, so the beauty of the trees, it became a problem. And because you haven't paid attention on the space, how much each of those trees requires for the growth, because tree need the space to grow. There's also some of the uh, thing that is tied to not just to you, but also to your neighbor or the, or the county in this case, distance from ditches, power lines, roads, um, and other infrastructure that is surrounding your property. 
also if you have uh, some machinery in your uh, uh, and uh, you're a farm and farm operation the size of the machine where you're going to turn how you're going to turn again you don't want to have a trees that, that impede your uh, business or your operation or your uh, everyday functionality you want to have a trees to add that your functional functionality what you performing uh, on your property um current and future distance from your neighbors lots of people again they plant right close to the uh close to the uh a property line and then down the road again became an issue uh, maybe your neighbor neighbor doesn't like trees provide the shade for the garden they want to cut they want to all kind of wrong things can go so pay attention where is your property and sometimes pulling back is i would strongly advise you on that annual snow accumulation uh, there's a good website there's a several website you can find out and don't forget, guys, also that lots of times, and sadly, I learned that from my career of 10 years in Alberta alone, where the lots of people got killed in intersections. And one of the reasons people don't get killed is it's the tree doesn't provide that uh, visibility or blocked, uh, blocked stop signs or all kind of things. And so make sure that you, when you plant all the trees, uh, if you're in close to intersection or close to the road signs, close to the public spaces, that they are uh, setbacks, that they're pushed back and that people, you know, that your trees are not gonna impede with the infrastructure of the, of the public. Here is the most important thing that you really guys have to spend some time and homework. And there's lots of people can help you. And I know county folks will help you in, in this many ways. Uh, start with the soil. Um, this is a, a, a secondary road uh, 592. Um, figure out what kind of soil you have. You have a clay, peat, sand, loams, uh, dry, wet, uh, uh, cell line. Each of that soil type will determine what kind of trees you can or cannot plant. Because if you have a lot of salinity, very few tree species and shrub species you'll be able to plant. If you have a heavy clay, there is a 50% of the tree species in Alberta that I would say, say don't plant them. They're gonna suffer and most likely they're gonna die. If you have a too much sand, there's other 50% who's gonna, uh, let's say pine love sands and spruce doesn't. And so you have to really pay attention what kind of soil you have. If you have a really superb soil, anything will grow. Uh, where is the sunlight and exposure? Those, uh, 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 it's very important because uh, some of the things, for example, spruce like the cooler, spruce and fir, they like the cooler northern exposure. They don't like to be totally exposed to the, uh, to the full sun uh, from the east, uh, south or west. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, pine, they love full sun exposure. They don't like shade. Uh, so you know where it is. So yeah, sometimes I always amaze when I look at people, I think this, this is a particular area that the, they, they planted on the south side, they uh, planted the spruce. This spruce should have been on the north side of the road. And because they like that cooler, um, cooler area in that sense. So again, that's where it is. Prevailing wind, where it's coming. I'm gonna show you one of the, one of the things tool that you're available to you. Topographic features is incredibly important. Like if you look at this road and you can see the slopes, you can see the, where the water flows um, and, and, uh, and uh, where is the pressure, where is the slough, where is the lake, where is the riparian area. Oh, the biggest thing with, with topographic things is water. Water runoff, water stays, how long does it stay? But it also topographic play the uh, sense of the sunlight and exposure as well but always pay attention where the water flows or where it stays. And that's where the topography play the role. And again, some of the species like more, more hillier, some of the don't uh, in that sense. And I guess that that's applied to the drainage uh, where the water flows again. Uh, the other thing what comes to the water is water quality. Lots of people contact me and said, also my trees are dry and I watered all the trees so much. And at first, my first question to them was, have you checked the salinity or sodium in your water? And said, no, well, they did. And they'd call me back, say, yeah, it's pretty high in the sodium. Uh, how much quantity of the water you have? You might be in an area that you said, you know what? I don't have lots of water. I don't have uh, access to the water. I don't have a uh, um, 
postponed. I don't have a dugout. I, I don't want to, you know, spend money on the on the on the uh, you know putting the uh, well into this. So the quantity of water could be an issue because you might need like a lot uh, this year in the summer. You need a lots of water to keep those trees alive uh, because the drought will be able to kill all of those trees. And the last, not least. Um, Visit all the established shelter boats and properties. Nothing better than look at in your neighbor or, or your surrounding area, what grows, how much grows. I find out many times that when I'm traveling, I stop by and ask people about the trees. And every time people are so proud when they see that trees are doing very well and what they've done, when they planted, how they planted, what was the good and bad and ugly part of that during the 20, 30, 40 years uh, since they have the trees. So, that local knowledge is extremely important. And again, the, the, the second uh, important thing is you have a, uh, you people in your county who are very knowledgeable people and they will help you out about this. They will say, yeah, no, don't plant this, plant this one. Uh, because they know the local, they know, they've seen the, so many places, Ken and, the, uh, and Amy or Dallas or, or Cody, all of those people know the local environment. And they can help you out and say, hey, yeah, what about you? I, I want to plant this one. Well, might not be the best, best idea to plant this tree. So that local knowledge is incredibly important. So before you decide on any of this, you know, drive by, stop by, ask people how they've done it. And, and that will help you out what kind of trees uh, you, uh, you might need a, a choose to plant on your property in that sense. So really spend, spend some time on this. Do the diligent homework uh, before you just throw the trees. I want the trees and then brush and plant and do everything else. Do the homework and say, yeah, this is what I know. What is my soil can be? I know what is my exposure. I know what is my water. I know where is the, uh, where is the slopes. I know where is the drainage. I know water quality and quantity. And I know that the other trees are doing okay in, the, in this area. It's very important that you guys do that. When there's no participation, I, I pick this. And you can see, guys, that you have a, a wind direction around the 20% coming from north, 16% uh, coming from east, and uh, around 20% coming from south, the rest of the northwest. Um, it's an amazing tool. And uh, you can see, I'm going to show you the next slide, see where it's coming from and how many hours, actually, we call the wind, wind rows. You can see how much rain you get. This is for uh, city of Red Air, uh, uh, data. But there's some weather station uh, outside the city that can obtain information like this. But as you can see, how much rain, how many millimeters of rain. I was really, really surprised to see the 120 millimeters of rain in June and July that you guys, that's a quite a bit, quite a bit rain uh, that you get. And there's also snow accumulation that you, over the period of time. Of, this is a, a information from last year. So last year you got uh, uh, 150 uh, millimeters of snow, which is quite, quite a bit... Uh, snow as well. So there's lots of tools that you can pick up and say, hey, okay, now I know. Um, this is one I call, we call the windrows because I do right now a uh, tree risk hazard assessment. And one of the biggest thing that tree failed down is, is the way the wind, wind direction is coming from. It basically tells me in this particular area in Reddit, what's the speed most of the time. This is how many hours they come. And I can really pull the data to see within how many months in what particular months you guys got a Southeast wind. So you guys get, get approximately seven, 600 hours of the south, southeast wind, or you get a probably 250 hours of the east wind, or the northeast, you have a way less. Okay, of course, predominant wind is the northwest uh, with the high speed. Of course, it's coming from northwest. I was, I was surprised how little, relatively speaking, how little wind you guys get from southwest. In many ways, you get the more wind from southeast than you get from southwest, hourly wise. So again, depending where is your property is, and, and you might pay attention to that. This is just one of the tools that you might pull from the website and very easy to obtain information about, about wind and wind direction. Technology. Um, here is a Google Earth, uh, two shots, and the, the third one is coming from, uh, from a drone. Um, it's beautiful. You guys in, on, on, on today technology can really draw the line. This is, again, I think, uh, yeah, 592, and this is a property. I don't know who owns this property. Beautiful property. 
and you can really measure the distance. You can see the, where the wet is. You can see uh, where is the prevailing wind. You can measure everything here on this uh, air photos. And I said, you know what? I want to put the trees here, here, here. And then I know, you know, it's coming from west, north, whatever side it might be. If you guys go and repair an area, again, there's a lot of tools available to you. And on top of that, if you really want to do the superb work, if you do have a drones and, and they are sometimes for the project with the county might pull the drones and really uh, uh, get information from the drone on the, some of the microsites or some of the depression or some of the different, um, different exposure, different uh, damages on and on and on. So again, so much tools available that uh, if you want to plant trees, uh, it's lots of tools that you can properly design, you can assess the soil, you can assess the site, you can uh, look at how much are distances from the roads and buildings and everything else. So there's a lot of uh, information for free available to you guys. And if you really need, uh, again, county folks do have uh, all of that available. They have air photos. Um, they can help you out um, if you really need it as well. Um, some of the physical structure, people, again, I, I kind of get sick and tired of traveling throughout Alberta. I see the lots of trees cut under the power line. And um, I always say to people, look above and look below when you plant the trees. Uh, look where is your water and sewage, where's the telephone wires, gas and propane, fences, building livestock. Bridge. Really make, uh, there is a one uh, fox sheet that is done. I, I've done together with the Ag Canada at the time that you can put the check marks and, and it's really easy to figure out what you have on your property or use the, again, use this Google, um, Google Earth or air photos or drones to figure out where those are. But make sure that, that you consider all of this when you plant the trees. Don't just say, oh, I'm going to plant the trees and suddenly you realize you planted trees under the power line or, or there is a cables or sewage or whatever. So make sure that you say, hey, I, I did a diligent work and make that I'm not going to impede with any of these. Or that might include the dugouts, which is very common that people plant the trees close to the dugouts and then they complain how roots of the trees um, taking all of the water uh, from dugouts. So again, do the some of the, I call the checklist uh, to make sure that you're not going to run into the trouble. Uh, local regulations. Um, how much is this from highways, or train tracks? Uh, if you get the, some of the importing exactly trees and shrubs, there is a regulation on that. Uh, tree removal, pest management, of course. Uh, we don't have, while well, we got last year, Dutch Elm disease last year, um, and the containing lead bridge. So um, you have to know some of the local uh, pest regulations. We have a Mount Pine beetle. Um, there is a distance from the road, 150 feet and 100 feet from home because of the insurance. And the reason for 100 feet from home is basically if your tree is gonna fall down on, on, on your property in the case of the wind and in the case of the fire. So make sure that you do have a, some of the distances. Again, um, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's a relatively easy to figure that out um, from, the, from the air photos of Google Earth. Now, so you did all of the homework, you did a site assessment. Um, you did a, some of the uh, checklists with the power lines and all the rest of the stuff. You, um, you looked at the photos, you know approximately what's the distances and now it's come to this uh, moment to the trees and shrub spaces. Again, a purpose and functionality. Purpose is I wanna fruits. Purpose is I wanna shelter. Purpose is I wanna beautify my property. Purpose is I wanna wildlife habitat. I wanna whatever and how that tree is gonna provide the function of that. So if you wanna in into the fruit production, well, guess what? You have to plant the fruit trees or shrubs that is gonna produce the uh, fruit. Um, and, and again, that's, that's your, that's your uh, 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 help you to the purpose. The second thing, again, it's a uh, Canadian plant hardiness zones is lots of people plant the tree that might not fit to your area. And I can tell you right now, guys, you are on uh, 3B or 4A it's still available on the web on the website. You can find out. I mentioned about soil and moisture requirements. Not every tree like too much water or too little water. So each of those trees has a you know they grow best at uh, when you have a sandy soil. You have a good pond. You have a pile of you have a wet area. Well, you're gonna might have a, a black poplar, a willows, elms, and on and on. 
again, site characteristics is, is very important. And let's go back to the environmental assessment that you guys have. Uh, form, shape, height, spread. Um, there is a tools I'm gonna show you. Some of those things when you look in the books or, 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 or research, they said a uh, tree is gonna spread, I don't know, 10, 20 feet. It's a, just a guidance. If you have a good site, then depending on the condition, that tree can have the crown 30, 40 feet spread. So it's just a guidance. No? And that's, a, that's a said, go back to your uh, visit already uh, mature trees that you're gonna really get sense how big those trees will be when they're really mature. Forget what sometimes books say. It's your property is unique in many ways. Um, how much is growth and lifespan? Some of the trees grow fast, die fast. Some of the other trees have grow slow, have a long lifespan. Uh, visual appeal and aesthetics. If that is important and that's your purpose of the plant in those trees, well, not every, every tree to me is beautiful, but not, I have on my uh, coniferous, I like tamarack and I like a birch. Those are my two favorite. Maybe not yours, but that's what it is. Uh, fruit producing or not. Some people say, Tosha, I don't want to. Some people said, hey, I like it. I like to see the birds. I like to use that, that fruit. Again, it's a choice. Each of the tree is gonna have uh, some disease and, and, and pest problems or environmental damage. There's no perfect tree, but some of them you might be aware uh, more than, than other. And how much you wanna maintenance and care. Do you wanna, you know, some of the trees are really required every year maintenance. Some of them just plant them and forget about them. And again, there is some interesting, unique characteristics that you can look. So those are some of the things that you have to consider. Now, I said all of that. Um, here is the here is a, some of the kind of the plant hardiness zone. Red Deer County is a 3B and 4A. So you guys have a lots of choice beside all of the native species that you have. And I'm going to mention them. There's plenty of them, uh, others that you might be able to plant. Um, Choose the right plant for the right place. Again, lots of people um, ask me to plant Ohio Buckeye Peace River. Well, might not work for Grand Prairie. Might not work. In your area, it would work like a charm. So it's plant health results available to you. You guys have a way better uh, choice than many other, other parts of Alberta, as you can see. Here is the tool. Remember, guys, I talk about this. This is a tool that can help you out. It's called plant search tool that most of the tree nurseries in Alberta can help you out. You, you go there and you go in this particular case is Eagle Lake Tree Nursery, which is south in Strathmore. And you can say, I want a trees and I want ever been trees. And you can, you can put this on the advanced search. And then I said, I want a, a this high, this spread, a foliage type, sunshade, soil, moisture, fall color, color. And they're gonna give you a list of those species. You click on what you like, and it's gonna give you further more description. I use this tool a lot. Even with all of my knowledge and everything else, I use this tool a lot. Just for, sometimes I forget, oh, this is interesting species. I have a client ask me, Tosha, I want a tree with the purple leaves. Ah, uh, there is a probably six or seven of them that can be planted. But this tool allow you to select that much faster than going in the books and find out which one has the purple, purple leaves. In that sense. So again, if you put the plant search tool and you can go to Eagle Lake Tree Nursery and you're gonna see the plant search and you have advanced, even more, more requirements, you just click on the mouse and it's gonna give you a list of the tree species that you might plant and press search basically. Wonderful tool, wonderful tool. Um, forms, there's a whole bunch of it. And again, don't forget that each of trees uh, has its own form. And if they're more exposed to the good soil and good sun, they can change that for. They might say, hey, I have a wonderful condition to grow and I'm not gonna be around, I might be spreading in that sense. So each of them are generally speaking, it has some guidance, but again, your local condition might change that. Might, they, 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 you, know, you see that lots of, for example, uh, spruce tree, they have a, this typical conical or pyramidal shape. And uh, when they have a really good condition, they will really be really wide. They might not have a conical or pyramidal, they might have a much more uh, spreading kind of looking shape trees and, and irregular or whatever. So there's lots of things that this is just general 
general description on the form that you might have. Uh, again, uh, depending on your, of your uh, soil and local conditions. Now, we're gonna go to some of the species, folks. Um, this workshop is about native species. Uh, I will mention some of them who are not native, that's your choice. Uh, and then we're gonna start with the pine. So that we have a four uh, native pine, jack pine, larger pine, uh, white bark, and limber pine. Limber pine and white bark, they are in the foothills and the Rockies. And actually white bark is almost endangered species. One of the oldest tree in Alberta is south in uh, uh, 700 years old Burmese tree. It's a dead tree, but it's still standing over there. It's a limber pine. Um, uh, the difference between the large pole pine and jack pine, if you really look at, and this is a cone, uh, I always uh, teach the people how they recognize between a large pole and jack pine. If you have a cone that they're pointing to top of the uh, tip of the branch is a jack pine. If you have a cone that is pointing toward to the trunk, is logical pine. So I always uh, uh, said to the people, logical uh, uh, um, pole comes in and jack comes out, if you want to remember. Overall, all of the pine love full sunlight, every single of them. Most of the jack pine, uh, they love uh, sandier soil. The more sand you have, they will, they will uh, grow better in some aspects. Now, uh, logical pine also can handle the sandier soil, uh, but overall, they like much more moisture. Most of the pine, generally speaking, have a little bit more top to it, so they can go further for the, for the, for the water push come to uh, shop. Um, Limber and white bark uh, is definitely on the mountain, uh, mountain ranges, and they can withstand horrendous wind and uh, also in the rocky, rocky places. I've seen people planting limber and white bark pine in St. Albert, matter of fact, and they're doing perfectly fine. They're absolutely <laughs> perfectly fine. So you can plant them. Again, they're a little bit, uh, again, they are much more in the foothills and in, in, in the higher elevation and rocky area. Um, they are definitely long-lived species. They can go, most of the large pine jack pine uh, can go 180 to 140, 150 years of age. Limber pine, 200, 300 years, same thing with the bite bark. So they're really long living species and relatively going very fast. Uh, they can uh, withstand huge winds. You, I always said to the people, you're never gonna see pine blow down as spruce. In my career, I've seen maybe six or seven pine that will blow down, but it was actually the, 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 the insect that griddled the, 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 on the bottom of the trunk. And that's one of the reasons why a tree fall down. They're having, quite a stable intensive root system and it's a perfect for the wind protection. Uh, plant them on the south side, east and south, even west is okay. Don't plant them on the north side. They don't like cooler, they don't like shade. Okay. Um, there is lots of pest issues, no doubt about that. Now, beside the native species, you have a squat spine, which is extremely widely popular in Alberta for the shelter boats. They have a wonderful uh, color of the bark, and they better have a very few insects and disease uh, problems. They grow very fast as well. Um, and again, it's one of the choices. You have a ponderosa pine, briscoe pine, mugo pine, um, uh, Austrian pine, there is a Swiss stone pine. All, all of those are non native, but they grow here in Alberta. And it's a choice that you might say, hey, I want a squirt pine and jug pine. Uh, combination of ponderosa pine. Um, as I said, all of them, generally speaking, like the sandier soil, and they don't like to, they don't like, none of them like the wet feet. Don't plant the pine when you have a wet feet in the soil that stays water stay for a long period of time. Your tree is going to die. So don't plant the pine when, you, when it's come uh, lots of, uh, lots of water. Spruces. There's a three of them, uh, white, black, and Engelmann spruce. And uh, those are on the bottom. Uh, one of the things with the black spruce, they, they have like a head on top of the, on top of the trees. Um, every time when I see the black spruce, I know it's a musket and the soil is very acidic. And you go in the forest when, when you have a lots of black spruce, you, you walk like in, on the cushion and lots of sphagnum moss and, and very high uh, water table and lots of acidity there. They're very skinny. So in the area when you have a muskeg and you know there is lots of water, you might throw the uh, black spruce. Engelmann spruce is usually on the foothills in the mountain region, 
But I said, I've seen Engelman's Proust in Edmonton doing perfectly fine. And White's Proust is uh, totally pretty much all of the, one of the wide, widest spread uh, species in North America, actually in Northern Hemisphere, uh, beside the Aspen in many ways. They, all of them will grow perfectly very well on the, on the well-drained, moist, silty soils. For all of them, the root system is very shallow. It's hearty. And one of the downfall of the spruce, they blow down very easy. So don't plant just spruce tree that is, uh, you know, totally exposed to the wind. Uh, eventually, they're going to give up, especially if you have an area that is lots of water. So the water soften the, soften the soil and you have a wind and spruce is going to blow down. Um, excellent in break. Uh, no doubt about that. Grow way slower than pine. Uh, and, uh, and again, prefer northern and colder western exposures. So tuck them in the north side. Now, you have a guy's uh, Colorado blue spruce, Norway, Black Hill, Serbian. I mean, I, uh, um, I can go with uh, many other uh, spruce trees that are growing here very well in Alberta. Um, it's a choice. Uh, I always said you have a native species, go with native. But again, if you want to choose something else, you, you have a lot of selection. Uh, from all of them, Colorado blue can sustain a lot more soil than others. Generally speaking, they don't like soil. And especially, please don't plant the spruce along the roads. They are notoriously killed by the salt coming from the road. They will absorb to the root system and suddenly you've got the whole tree brown. First became red, then became brown. So do not, do not put a row of the spruce tree if you know you have a highway and they're using the sodium. Push that tree, put the some soil uh, saline uh, shrubs and tree species. Do not export spruce. is one of the very common things I see lots of spruce, that spruce in, along the roads. So don't do that. Push them further away from the roads. Tamarack or Severian Lodge, we have uh, uh, four of them, uh, actually three of them. Uh, Western, which is way south, uh, uh, close to the uh, Pincher Creek area, um, and the subalpine, Lalais, uh, and Tamarack or Lodge, which is in northern parts of Alberta. Uh, one of the things, with, this is the only conifers uh, in the world that shed the needles in the fall and grow them in the spring. So you see the beautiful golden color in, the, in, in your area and you come in winter time and this tree looks naked and you said, oh my God, this tree is dead. It's not, it's Tamarack or Lodge. So don't get confused, but they have an incredible, incredible uh, a golden color of the, of the, of the uh, needles. And they're very soft. They come in bundle of like a 20 of them. And they are so good. They grow very fast. They, um, they like full sunlight. Uh, and uh, they have a low tolerance to the shade. Um, you have an introduced species. It's called Siberian Lodge. They like to much prefer on the drier side. And the native species like to much more prefer on the wetter side. So depending, so tamarack or, or native tamarack and larch, they go in the wet area, more wet area. Siberian goes on the more drier site and they like more uh, drier feet and they will grow very well. They grow like a three or four feet. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful species to choose. Fir, this is the most, uh, most underplanted trees in, on private land in Alberta. I love firs. Uh, we have a native uh, three species, balsam, Douglas fir, and subalpine. Folks, Douglas fir, which is most of the folks thinking, oh, there's no way you're going to grow in Alberta. I've seen shelter belts of Douglas fir in Bonneville. Uh, where I used to work at the city, you know, in Edmonton, we have a beautiful rose of Douglas fir. This is a subalpine fir where I used to work. Look at the trees. It's stunning. All of those, the balsam fir, are in Edmonton, growing like incredible, very well. In, uh, they have a nice and flat needles. They smell. They are true Christmas tree. All of the Christmas grower, it's, this is a cr true Christmas tree. Um, Douglas fir has incredible strong widespread root system and they can sustain the fire. I measured a couple of Douglas fir west of Cochrane, 375 years old. I think some of these trees that I measured way back. Um, wind fir and fire comes through and they survive, no problem. Uh, all of the firs are like cooler, northern, or westerny slopes where it's cooler. They grow uh, even slower than spruce. 
but the beauty of the of the having the other trees and and especially the smell of the needles is just incredible. It's the most underutilized species I've seen in Alberta. If you have ever chance and you get a good soil and you want to plant some of the other trees, definitely plant balsam fir. I would in red deer, I would definitely plant a Douglas fir. And I have a no doubt in western parts of the Red Deer County, you guys can plant a subalpine fir. It's incredible, you know, those species are very, very good uh, tree species. And again, um, mostly under, under planted trees in Alberta. Cedar is in juniper, none of them are native. Uh, good for the uh, protection. Uh, they do have a problem with the cedar apple rust, doesn't kill the cedar, but it's gonna kill your hot thorns and apples and crab apples and on and on. Um, they, are, they can definitely be, get hit by the, by the winter kill in some aspects, but they're very resilient. So this is a much more for your privacy in your yard. If you want to do it, there is a whole range of the cedars and, and juniper that you can plant, but none of them are native. Just want to mention to you guys. Shrubs, again, there's a smaller version of the, of the juniper or fir or spruce or pine or, or yew, matter of fact. So there is a relatively speaking smaller amount of the shrub uh, coniferous shrub species that you can you can plant. Uh, now we're going to go to hardwood species. Uh, of course, one of the best uh, known is the aspen and poplar and cottonwoods. Uh, they are native. Uh, definitely, cottonwoods can grow in your area with no problem. That one on the right corner is the cottonwood in, in one of the largest cotton I've seen. Well, not the largest, one of the relatively oldest in in uh, Red Lethbridge uh, Air Canada Research Station. Station. On the right corner is coming from Blair Red Ferry Provincial Park. Beautiful trees. I measured over there uh, four trees. They were like a four and a half feet wide. Um, incredible growth. And you guys can grow cottonwood in your shelter both in your area, no doubt about that. Um, balsam poplar, uh, it's all uh, love every time. If you can choose between aspen and black poplar or balsam poplar, black poplar will go where there's lots of water. Aspen can grow, but they don't like it as much. So if you are around the riparian area, always try with the balsam poplar. They can take like a one mature 60, 70 foot balsam poplar tree in a day can take a 300, 500 liters of water. Just go to one tree. It's incredible. Um, they have an extremely extensive root system. Um, uh, they are very wind firm, uh, but they sucker a lot. One of the things you can do if you guys want to regenerate and get your natural forest coming back, cut alive trees uh, and they will produce the thousands of suckers and natural forest is going to come back. Many times under riparian management, I said to people, cut one or two live trees, balsam poplar or aspen or cottonwoods, you're going to get the 10,000 suckers coming back. And that's the, probably the best way you can regenerate natural forest. It's, they, they, that's what they are. Uh, one of the biggest living thing organism in the world is uh, 47 acres aspen tree in Utah. One single tree produces so many suckers from one parent tree that is mind boggling, 47 acres in that sense. So it's, it's native, hardy, work with them, easy to regenerate, fast growing, black poplar and cottonwood like red feet, aspen pretty much can grow anywhere. Hybrids. All of most of the hybrids coming from the black poplar folks or cottonwoods. It's, uh, there is a range of them. They're growing fast. Relatively speaking, they die fast. Uh, it's been used in Alberta uh, for so many years. It's a choice. Um, many times I said go with the native instead of, instead of hybrids. Native black poplar or, or cottonwood or aspen will grow as equally fast as, as, the, as the hybrids. So it's a choice. Birch. We have a native birch uh, uh, as a tree. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, of course, um, paper birch. Uh, there's a lot of uh, shrubby form birch uh, that is uh, mostly in the shrub. I think Kenny's going to talk about them. There's a lot of um, uh, clones, varieties that, you know, from weeping to Dakota pinnacle to chickadee and on and on. All of the, with the birch, whatever you plant the birch, do not allow water to stay. They like the, when, the, when the water go to the soil, but doesn't stay. They don't like too much dry either, but they like the uh, area where is the water comes in and kind of good drainage. So they, they, they can't stay 
in the sanded dunes or, or, or acidic uh, sites. You, you, you know, those trees can. Now, you have a smaller shrubby uh, bird trees that can stay in acidic bog sites, and uh, Ken might talk about that. Um, but again, for the tree itself, um, again, where is a good drainage, that's what you want. Then require some of the good soil. There is a bird border that and drought is really killing lots of birds. I always said water bird trees in a fall, really, and put the wood chips if you have on on private property. Put the wood chips and put the water trees in a fall. Maples, unfortunately, none of them are native. Uh, we know about Manitoba, Amur, Flame, Hot Wings, and Crimson. I can go on and on. There's lots of maple. None of them are waiting. They are very good, actually, uh, varieties that is, you know, in the moisture requirements. They are relatively growing very fast. Many of them have a winter stem dieback, like a civil, uh, civil maple. They are, Manitoba can handle the drought, no doubt about that. One of the downfall of the maples that produce lots of Samaras, lots of those little seeds that are flying around, and lots of people don't like that. But uh, again, uh, they are really prolific uh, seed producers. So, but choice, is there, again, don't forget, no native species. None of them of those are native species. Ash, same thing with ash. We don't have a native ash. In Edmonton, we have 77,000 of our green ash trees alone. Um, they grow very fast. They can take lots of abuse. Uh, they grow in incredible conditions. Uh, they are deep-rooted. Um, they are very flexible when come to the moisture requirements. Uh, they will grow slower under the dry condition. One of the downfall of the, of the ash trees, they, they uh, leaf out late in May, and the first tree species to lose the leaf is the ash and the August. So the amount of uh, time that ash tree has a leaves is the shortest among the, all of them. Um, again, there is a whole range of the variety of them. One of the things with ash tree, we don't have a yet uh, in base, have a large border, it's in Winnipeg, but also in southern United, uh, in Dakotas as well. That one can really decimate our ash tree in um, urban area or shelters. And they're also very prolific seed producer. They produce seeds every year. So um, ash tree and Manitoba maple, and maples, they produce the seeds quite extensive. Um, the other species that, again, one of them that I like it, I grew up with oak, I have to mention the oak, there is a burr oak and northern pin and top gun in that sense. They are slow growing. Uh, they prefer, prefer full sunlight, good moisture, good deep soil. Um, Ohio Baca is way harder. It's a beautiful color. They have a really funny smell of the leaves and or, or the or the or the fruit as well. Um, contain uh, nuts contain the tannic acid and can kill the turf. No doubt about that. But look at the photos in the fall of the Ohio Baca. Just stunning beauty. And on the spring, they have wonderful showy. I, I, uh, whitish, yellowish colors. So it's very widespread species. Both of them you can grow. None of them are native species. Elms, same with elms. None of them are, are native species. Um, they uh, love lots of wet feet. They will grow with lo lots, of, with lots of moisture. They have an incredible extensive root system. Um, and uh, some of them are Siberian. It's level, lots of dieback, winter dieback. Uh, Dutch elm disease is always threat. Um, definitely kill the turf grass, so in some aspects, yeah, but it's a majestic tree. So incredible. I love, I love M trees. So again, none of them are native, native species. Um, this is one of the species. I also grew up lindens, uh, American true no, drop more, more than little leaf. Beautiful. Back in Europe, where I grew up, we collect uh, uh, flowers from this tree and make a linden tea. Oh, it's a lovely smell. And it's very tasty. And on top of that, uh, bee producers, they uh, put lots of beehives around the linden trees and they produce the uh, honey made out, out of linden. Oh, it's incredible tasty. This tree is in, in Alberta has a very, very, very few uh, pests. Nothing kills this tree in some aspects, except the winter sometimes. Um, they grow very, very fast, very beautiful trees, and they have uh, this uh, like uh, uh, seeds that stay all winter long. And lots of birds like it. They produce lots of uh, sprouts at the bottom or, or at the base of the trees, but incredible, beautiful trees. Again, I'm biased on this because I grew up <laughs> with them and I, those are trees back where I come from, it's um, probably 90 feet tall. So it's a beautiful tree. Willows, 
Uh, we have a lot of small native willows and, and shrubs. Um, Ken will like, have a, a lot of introduced willows, like a golden leaf, uh, golden lower leaf, acute, and on and on. Anywhere when you have a wet, when you have a lots of water, plant willow. Um, they can they can sustain huge. They can be for three weeks, four weeks under the water, like completely flooded. They can sustain that. Uh, avoid the planting near buildings. Avoid the same thing with aspen and balsam poplar. Don't plant them near buildings and and uh, dugouts. They will they, they have, because they have extensive roots. Um, they can sustain a very heavy clay soil. You uh, elm, poplars, aspen, cottonwoods, willows, all of them will sustain. If you have a lots of clay and lots of moisture, this is the species that you might plant. And there is also a range of the small tree species I have to put, you know, from cork tree, burrow, camu tree, maples, sorbus, and on and on. So there is a ivory silk lilacs, and there's lots of all, of, none of them are na native species, absolutely none of them. But again, just choice. And then people ask me about columnar species. Uh, we don't have any of them. We have a Swedish husband, uh, uh, white birch, uh, top gun oak, emeralds, spire, crab apples, and pears and on and on uh, again none of them are native species folks uh this is this is again this is nothing to you know i obviously is not going to give you money on this it's your choice to buy it but just i want to mention to you guys um if you guys have a problem with the salt and high sodium level uh here is a list of the salt tolerant species one of them i had to put but i want to tell you do not ever plant ever them two of them actually uh caragana and sea buckthorn oh the the uh, other buckthorn uh oh my god my brain uh, freeze there is um oh anyway it's not a sea buckthorn it's the other other buckthorn that common buckthorn that is really invasive absolutely invasive species so do not plant caragana please please don't do that they are very i can accept people planting caragana in Norway or deep in the prairies where there's nothing else and you have a high sodium, but don't plant in your county. It's extremely invasive, extremely can go in your area, can run amok and destroy everything. They're nitrogen fixer, no doubt about that, but they are almost indestructible in that sense. So here is the, some of the list of the species that is, and same thing with the Russian olive, don't plant, do not plant. Um, unless again, you are really, really waste in the Red Deer County, but even that, I, there's a plenty of other species that you can plant. But I just have to mention that. And again, don't forget to plant, don't plant the spruce along the roads. Don't do that. Okay. Uh, shrubs. You're gonna jump into shrubs. There's a, uh, I'm gonna go through all of the native species. Pin cherry is one of the favorite. Um, I love them. They usually grow on the edges, uh, and uh, and uh, they produce a beautiful beautiful color of the of the flowers and, and the fruit. Uh, they sucker very quickly and can be propagated from the root cuttings, no problem about that. Um, growing very fast, uh, but all of the prunes, like a choke cherries and, and pin cherries, they have a, a they contain the sangenic toxic seeds that can be occasional poisons for the livestock and uh, and for people in some aspects, but mostly for the livestock. It's incredibly good for the uh, uh, reduced erosion, nutrient runoff. So if you have a site that are really abused, and really poor soil, and you want to reclaim it, um, here is one of the one of the choices that you can use. Same thing with chalk cherry, um, and uh, and again, it's growing very fast. Um, loved by the anglets, uh, from bears and coyotes and foxes and and uh, lots of butterflies and honeybees. Um, native species grows very well on lots of soils, from infertile to the very rich soils. Relatively, uh, if I have to choose, if you have lots of drought, choose the, choose the chalk cherry versus pin cherry. Chalk cherry can handle drought way better than, than the pin cherry. And they can grow more inside of the forest. Uh, pin cherry need a fuller, more, more sunlight. This one more shade tolerant in, in many ways. Uh, big hazelnut uh, is uh, nitrogen fixed as well. Uh, be careful with this one. Sometimes I've seen so many natural forests when the aspen and you have a, uh, this shrub and, uh, and aspen start dying out and this shrub literally occupy five, six acres just shrub. And it's very, very thick that even moose is not gonna go to that area. It's a very aggressive 
uh, but you have to have it under the control. Uh, they don't tolerate, uh, um, they don't prefer the hot and dry open areas. They are not going to uh, grow in, in open areas and it's very dry. Uh, they establish very quickly after the fire because of the mycorrhiza and nitrogen fixer. Um, love the wildlife uh, species, love it. And one of them, actually, the rough grouse. They love to grow. If you ever want to go hunting, uh, you're going to find the rough grouse, you're going to find there's lots of hazelnut because they hide there. It's very thick and they hide from foxes and coyotes and all the rest of it, right? All the rest of the um, predators. Suckering is prolific. Again, um, I strongly recommend to plant, but control it. They can really spread very, very much. Saskatoons, it's all of them is native. Uh, not all of them native, but it's native species. Um, there is a different varieties for the just for fruit production. Um, uh, there's lots of diseases from juniper rust to Cytospora cancers, aphids, and powder mildew, and on and on. They don't like wet area. They, they don't, um, they're growing very fast, they need a good drainage. And they're incredibly good for the pollination. Uh, river elder or speckled elder, that's also indicated when I see this one, it's very um, uh, not productive soil uh, along the river banks, where there's lots of gravelly kind of soil, slightly acidic uh, along the lake, sh lake shores. Uh, also very good nitrogen fixer, um, incredible growth. Uh, sucker and sprout is very common and good for reclamation. Uh, this is a species that would definitely go along the riparian areas and uh, where there's lots of water, um, commonly used by the beaver and, and, and the browse by the moose, which is very common. It's a very good choice. And they can probably grow 14, 15, 16 feet. I've seen, I measure some of them like a 20 feet. So they're in really tall, tall shot. Canada buffalo berry or soap berry is also native species. Um, variable side, this one it grows in really range of the things from top of the mountains kind of thing to the to rocky coarse textured uh, soil, uh, slightly acidic. They can grow in open forest, but also inside the forest I've seen it. Good for soil reclamation. Again, other uh, uh, additional nitrogen fixed. Why some of those species and nitrogen fixes is actually very good for your other species. If this species fixed the nitrogen into the soil is uh, help the soil, that other species need an nitrogen to grow. So having some of those species is, is very important. Um, not palatable to livestock, and that's why it's called soapberry. It's kind of soapy, and if you touch the, touch the leaves, it's pretty soapy. Potentilla is actually native species in Alberta. And there's all, uh, all of the varieties that is, uh, uh, people are using in landscaping. It's very hardy. I, what I like about this one, or, or shrubby sink while, I like they flower in September. Oh, I when I see the yellow color in September, everything is, yeah, no winter and snow is coming. And then I walk by and see this one and it's still flowering. Incredible. I love it. It's very drought tolerant, um, almost indestructible in some aspects. Most of the time it's a winter kill that kills them, um, but it's very good, good shrub species to plant. Now, those are species that you might guys have. If you want to plant them, you make something called planting stock. And you have a lot to speak in three or four choices. Um, you have a bay root that you, you guys can uh, see here. And I want you guys, if you can see it, maybe not the best way, you can see the transition between the roots and the stem. That's the depth that you're going to plant. So again, you can see in this picture, it's like a, where is this line almost. You can see those two, and that's the way they were planted. That's the depth you're going to plant. This is where the root. Uh, root color is that's where the stem starts this is where the root starts and that's the depth that you're going to plant those the trees most of the time you're going to get in the plugs like this and again you can plug and over there you this is a depth that you're going to plant them if you want to have willows and poplars you have a cuttings you have a whips or some other ways uh have uh plugs uh it's just the willow and uh, an oak or whatever it is you can be in this form price is variable it can go from 60 cents, depending on the size, to dollar, two, three, four, five, depending what you plan. But that's, a, let's say from 25 cents to $5, uh, all of this stock. Now, if you guys want to burl up in baskets or potted stock, it's a totally different ball game. Uh, we are talking about probably between two hundred fifty to two three hundred dollars, between sixty and hundred eighty dollars. This is where the budget is. 
they, depending what you want. Do you want an instant forest or you don't want an instant forest? Depend, really depending what you want. So that's about, generally speaking, for a native tree plant, this is the stock you want to go. It's a smaller stock you planted. We have an expression we, we use, I use a lot. Um, small tree become big, big tree become small. You plant this one, you have a better chance for survival. Need a more attention, a couple of years, better chance of survival, better chance of the establishment, and they grow overall, grow faster. You plant some of this one, you're definitely bigger trees. You guys, you see this burlap in basket. 80% of the roots of these trees gone. When they put in this, 80% they cut from, from here. It's gone. And it takes a way longer to establish the root system when you plant a bigger stock than when you plant a smaller stock. That's why we use the phrase, smaller trees became big, big trees became small, because eventually smaller trees catch up and, and, and really and really fast. So this one is a dollar, this one is $300. So you can take a 300 of these to plant this one. But that's the choice. Um, side prep, whatever you do, my friend Terry was using the road to tillin and tilling, remember that first photos I show you of his property and this is where he start from scratch. Uh, you can do the strip, you can use the roundup and tilt, which is I personally try to tell you, do not use the herbicide to try to weed control personally, but it's your choice. Uh, this is actually a picture from the United States. They use the roundup, kill it, they plant the trees right away. Um, again, uh, spot tilling, uh, you can tilling and use the plastic mulch, strip tilling, uh, native and riparian, no tilling at all. You plant the trees over there and whatever survives, survives. Whatever you do, my advice, you do have to have a, some side prep. If you have a none, you, your chances of probability of tree survival is way lower. Now, you have a second thing to the side prep is the weed control. So you have to have a side prep, you plant them, then is the next one is the weed control. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna mention it, it's a weed control. So whatever you do, you, whatever is your budget, whatever equipment you have, whatever you wanna do it, uh, try to do some of the side prep, if you can. If you have a natural repairing area, you might not have, but you might need different uh, weed control to uh, let those trees to survive. Otherwise they will die from the, from the competition, from the weeds. And that's why it's side prep, you need it. And in some, in some area when you have a heavy compacted pasture soil, you need to do the uh, uh, side prep. Anyway, when you have a compacted soil and heavy clay or something like that, you need to do some side prep. Planting, this is me. You can do the equipment or uh, a shovel and uh, plant all the trees. What we did with a friend of mine, uh, Don Luzica. So what he did, he put the first, uh, first plastic mulch and then I was making a hole he was coming after me and plant the trees and then we, we, we change. So he makes a hole uh, and I plant the trees and this is how it looks like. Some people do what they do, they plant the tree first, then they put the plastic mulch option. I find out that this technique is much better. You put the plastic mulch, you're done, and then you go with this and plant the trees. But if you want a, a, a mechanical, you have to put the uh, trees first, then you put the plastic mulch. Um, Choice. It's again. I think the trees has a, uh, the county has a tree planter as well. Um, but again, those are two. And now I've seen that some people use the drones in a larger forest area. They just shoot with the drones, which is still questionable, but it's incredible actually. Um, pay attention with the trees when you plant them. Uh, store them. Protect them. Uh, plant is how much you can really plant. Don't try to take all of them at once. And uh, and I personally in a day. Don and I, we planted 2,400 trees in a day. Uh, if I by myself and plant like this gentleman, this gentleman can plant 4,000 trees, uh, maybe I can plant 600, maybe. Probably 400, realistic. This fellow, 600, uh, 4,000. So, uh, and again, caliper of trees is totally different planting method. Um, this is a picture of the tree planting depth. I constantly use where, how far, either you have a, burlap or, 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 or a container, or you have a natural, it's in very important that you plant where the root begins and where the stem begins. That has to be in the level with the top of your soil. Do not plant too deep or too shallow because you have a high probability to kill the trees. 
weed control. This is a perfect photo. You have a plastic mulch, you have a, a chemical control, you have a mechanical control. The reality is most of you might not have ever something like this. But whatever you do, you have to have a, some three to five years, you have to have a, some weed control. If you want to use the chemicals, which I prefer not to, um, there's a plenty of chemicals. Your staff in the county have a way more knowledge than I do when it comes to the weeds and controlling the weeds. Um, you have a bush mat. That's something I, I call it's a one uh, foot by foot. They can come from, uh, uh, they can be made of oil and gas, and they can be also from the uh, renewable materials uh, uh, that can use and they're biodegradable in that sense. Uh, some people use the sheep fescue, which is very good as a weed control. Whatever you do, mats, sheep fescue, plastic mulch, uh, mechanical, uh, chemical, you have to have a three to five years of the, of the control uh, of the weeds. Uh, this one, I always strongly suggest for the people to, to consider, especially if you in the small acreage and urban areas, plant, put the wood chips. Wood chips is probably the best thing you can do for your trees in the long run, if you can. Those are just much more from, your, from homes or, or something like that. This is not for the natural tree planting, you know, in riparian area or eco buffer or something like that. Even in eco buffer, if you have a lots of wood chips and try to put the wood chips to protect from the weeds, they just not protect the weeds. They keep the most important, protect the roots. Wood chips protect the moisture and protect the roots. That's, that's one of the beauty of the wood chips and also provide the nutrients. Um, but the, the, again, um, if you can, it it's, could be expensive uh, and uh, go back to the key messages, do some work in winter time. You have lots of tools to build and develop the maps and everything else. Understand your site, understand what you're, uh, get you understand your land and uh, choose the planting stock appropriately. Mostly I would choose smaller one. If you have a budget for big one, okay, that's, that's fine. Plan the properly. That's the biggest thing. And um, understand why, purpose and function. Now, every, as I mentioned in, in my talk about trees, every tree has a plus minus. I, I call it the good, the bad, and ugly. There's no such a thing as perfect tree. Absolutely not. Um, but again, understand the local conditions. If you have a kind of hilly and waving area, don't plant what is it, you know, when it's a, uh, on the bottom of that hill, plant pine. No, put the something where the, because the water is going to be there put something that the water loaming. Pine might be on the top of the hill. And again, one of the people make a common mistake. You have a whole different landscape and they put a one tree species. And five years down the road, 30% of that because they're not, uh, the soil and the moisture is not the same uh, when you have a, a area like that. So the last and not least, please plant as many as possible native trees and shrubs. Um, as I mentioned, you have a quite variety of the native trees and shrubs that you can plant. So lots of, lots of them is available to you. And Ken is gonna talk about them. Be creative. Don't plant in lines. Don't plant, you know, be creative. Experiments, you know, as, as a friend Terry, he planted 54 of them, species. And not in the, in the, in the rows and not whatever. Just be creative. Try to mimic nature. That's how we serve people as much as you can. And the more you plan, the better it is. Thank you. I assume Ken or Cody will step up and... Uh, is there any questions there? I haven't even checked that. Hey, Toso. So yeah, I do see there is a question here. Let me just scroll to the... Martina has a question. Okay. I don't know if you're seeing it or um, I, I'm, want me yes, to read I'm it seeing. Uh, They bought an acreage three, two yeah. years ago and they had beautiful trees, choke cherry in the front yard, about 25 feet high. It had black knot throughout. Spent a lot of time cutting it out and disinfecting between each cut. We're in the black branches, but the black knot is back. Should she just continue to trim it back or does it need to be removed? There are also a couple other bushes that have black knot. What's the best way to remove the whole bush? It's with the black knot folks, um, it's a native spe native native fungi. Uh, it's uphill battle. It's usually because when you when she mentioned Martin, you mentioned that you have a, a 25 feet, that tells me that those uh, uh, those uh, shrubs are very old. 
and definitely Black Knot will go much more on the older. The Black Knot will can go on all of them, but uh, most likely it's maybe it's best time to remove the entire shrubs and they will come back. Suckers and new growth is going to come back, and and that's one of the way um, that you might reduce the amount of black. But there is no way you can get rid of the Black Knot. They don't have an illusion about that. It's just uh, spread by the wind and the moisture. And you might do it, and your neighbor has a full feel of them, and uh, and it's it, it's impossible to to fight that. So sometimes when you have a especially such a large and older trees, take a portion of them, cut them to the ground, let the new growth comes in, and the suckers comes in and and, and regenerate over the period. You might keep the 10, 15 percent of the older one just to keep it, um, but try to try to regenerate. And uh, younger stuff might might fight back bad at black knot, and I've seen that that some of the younger stuff simply fight back back because they're more bigger and they don't allow it to do that. Um, but no no illusion, you cannot remove the black knot out of out of your property. It's going to be there. Um, there's no any chemical and pruning. You did a good job with the pruning, and you did what's supposed to be. But it's again sometimes the best way you might remove all of it and start from scratch. How about that? Thanks, Toso. So I, I think black knot's one of those community problems too. That because it's spores, um, you might do a great job removing it all, but maybe you're uh, getting some spores from somewhere down the road too, windborne or, or what have you. Um, yeah, Martina. Again, it's it's a tough. It's a tough. The other thing, what Martina, what you might do uh, is if you can, some of those species that I'm uh, shrub species that I mentioned. You might reintroduce them. You might plant them. Uh, uh, kind of the buffalo berry, um, river elder, uh, even pink cherry is way less acceptable than choke cherry uh, overall. You might try to get some of the different uh, shrubs into your property and try to uh, reduce overall amount of choke cherry that you might have. Um, and that's one of the way you might reduce the, reduce the, because there is the other viruses and bacteria and fungi that might go after the black knot and um, and and again it, it, it's uphill battle uh, in that sense thanks terry <laughs> yeah yeah terry uh, i found the western choke cherry in our place it has a little bit you're right yeah um i have a natural uh choke cherries i've seen it in natural forest zero or little black knot and you go three miles down the road, forest full of them, full of the black knot. Um, as you mentioned, western choke cherry definitely is, is way more resilient than, than uh, some other species. And May Day is the worst, absolutely the worst in, in cities and urban area. May Day is something absolutely infested by the black knot. But it's a, one of the one of the uh, nature way that you know, it's a part of the nature in nutshell. Um, thanks, Toso. There's a, I guess, a comment here from uh, Brenda Wiggins. Uh, lots of good info in your presentation. Do you have this information somewhere? Uh, I'm sure you're um, your I have a blog, uh, Brenda. Uh, on the bottom, I put the blog. I uh, this presentation will be available to the county. So you guys, um, I'm going to send it as a PDF file, and you use whatever you want. <laughs> Uh, to be honest, and, and you can send, uh, if you want, Brenda, I can send you my presentation on this one. Um, if you have any any questions, you know, I always have go first with the county staff and many of them are able, able to handle lots of three questions. And if they don't know, they will one way or another contact me and I can provide information. Um, again, on my blog, I have a several uh, blog uh, that I wrote and this winter I'm going to put way more in many ways, uh, Brenda, but Stay tuned. Again, you can uh, you can subscribe on my blog uh, over there, folks. And and uh, uh, if you want, I will you know just and yeah, I'll, this winter I'm going to produce way more blog uh, than uh, than what is there. Excellent. Thanks, Toso. Uh, yeah, we will. We are recording this uh, presentation. Toso usually lets us uh, share this for a little bit, a little while. We can share the recording with um, those in attendance. We'll probably have it linked on our website as well, as well as uh, uh, other tree information that we do have. So, uh, yeah. And I, I will, I'll send you PDF as well, guys. 
I was even gonna have a PDF and you can send it to the people if you really want. Excellent. Well, I think Tosa is going to stay on for a little while. Ken will jump in. I don't think he's got a, a needs a whole lot of time, but uh, Ken, if you'll take over the presentation, and, um, and we can do a little round of questions if uh, if there's more uh, at the end. I'll take it away, Ken. Awesome. Thanks, Cody. And thanks, Tozo. That was, uh, as usual, uh, an awesome, very informative presentation from a guy who knows his trees left, right, and center. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about our funding programs. Uh, we have two funding programs available to residents in Red Deer County. I'll focus on those, uh, but I will, in case there are people online who are maybe from other areas, uh, there are a couple of other, or I, I do have a slide that'll talk about that as well if you're in another uh, area. So uh, I'm gonna talk about our ALICE program. Tozo mentioned that. Um, it's our program that funds, among other things, uh, projects, uh, tree planting projects on farms and ranches. Uh, we can fund native shelter belts, eco buffers and random planting projects. Um, for acreage owners, we have the Green Acreages Program, uh, and it can fund, again, native shelter belts, eco buffers, random planting projects, and other planting projects. Um, just going to see a question there. Okay. See a question there. Um, we'll maybe tackle that at the end here after I get through the funding program. Uh, so we'll come back to that, Richard. Um, I do want to look at or let you know about the eligibility requirements for both programs, just so you um, know what uh, what you need to do. These are essentially uh, minimum standards. So in order to qualify for funding, uh, a tree planting project would have to meet these uh, criteria here. So for Alice, again, this is our, our program for tree planting projects on farms and ranches. Uh, the project has to be on agricultural land uh, and that land has to be either marginal for um, annual crops or has to be environmentally sensitive. As well, the project, the planting site itself has to be at least a, a half acre in size. Uh, there has to be a minimum number of species and this goes back right to the very beginning of, of Tozo's presentation. We wanna make sure that there's as much species as possible. So again, these are minimum numbers. Uh, if it's a random planting, especially like an understory planting, uh, there has to be at least one um, type of tree going, tree, tree or shrub going in. Uh, if it's more of a native shelter belt, then there has to be at least three different species. And if it's an eco buffer, then there has to be at least seven species. So again, we're trying to um, support as many different species going into the ground as possible. Uh, we do have to see a site preparation plan. So a lot of those tips that Tozo was talking about, we need to see uh, a good site preparation plan as a bare minimum. If, uh, if it's a shelter belt or an eco buffer going into former annual cropland, we would need to see at least one pass of tillage. And if it's going more into a forage, uh, again, as a shelter belt or an eco buffer, then it would be two pass tillage. And again, these are minimums, absolute bare minimums. Uh, we, of course, need to see a watering plan, so you need, to, you need to be able to show us that you can water the trees for at least three years if we do get some dry years. Uh, and if, they're, if it's applicable either, and you have livestock, you would need to exclude those uh, livestock from the planting site for at least five years. And this is key. Um, in order to qualify for both of our programs, the trees and shrubs have to be native to the local area. And you need to have a weed or con competing vegetation plan for at least three years, like Tozo was talking about. We need to see that. Um, might not be required if you're planting some trees in the understory of an existing forested area. So that's our eligibility requirements for our ALICE program. Oh, and can't forget this one. Um, it has to be at least 25 meters from the center line of any public road. Uh, Tozo mentioned that too, far municipality. 
that's our uh, minimum distance uh, in agricultural land is that the trees have to be at least 25 meters from the center line of any public road. So for green acreages, um, minimum, so again, this is for either single parcel out type acreages or in multi-lot subdivisions. Again, the trees and shrubs have to be native species only to qualify for, for funding. You have to have at least three different species in your planting project on the acreage. Uh, you need to have at least uh, six different individual plants per species. And again, we're aiming for diverse plantings um, and has to be at least 15 square meters on acreage. It's, it's fairly small, but we're still looking for at least a minimum of, of 15 square meters being planted. And if your acreage is zoned ag, you do have to use that uh, 25 meter from the center line of any public road for those sites as well. It's in a multi-lot, there could be different rules apply. But that's our standard eligibility requirements then for funding for our green acreages program. And these are the funding numbers. So with our Alice program, you can get funding up to 85% of invoice costs to those maximums there, 3,000 if it's a random planting, 4,000 if it's more of a traditional but still native shelter belt, and even up to $10,000 if it's an eco buffer. I should point out here, this, this is an eco buffer project uh, funded by Alice, um, and that is a hemp mat. Uh, hemp matting that uh, is used, uh, Tozo was talking about similar products, um, used useful for weed control, holding moisture, uh, that sort of thing. And so we're trying it out in, in this particular Alice project in that photo. With our green acreages, uh, here's how the funding works with that program. You can apply for 75% of invoice costs to a maximum of $2,000 for the actual plants and other planting costs. Plus over and above that, you can apply for 75% of invoice costs to a maximum of $1,000 for site preparation. That's how we do it for green acreages. Um, just wanted to plug this um, really useful tool for helping, helping you find native trees and shrubs that can grow in your area and qualify for our funding programs. Uh, this is the Oz uh, Agroforestry Woodlot Extension Society is what, what Oz stands for. Uh, this is their native tree and shrub database that they've put together. It's available at the website there on the bottom uh, left of the screen. Uh, and you can go there and it's, um, you can um, find the trees and shrubs that, that should grow well in your local area and that are native to your local area. And as it says there, most of Ranger County is in the Aspen Parkland natural region. Um, the far western edge of the county is in the boreal natural region. So you can go to this site, select the natural region that you're in. You can choose different soil characteristics, um, uh, different types of plants and stuff that you're looking for, and it'll um, generate a list of, of native trees and shrubs that should do well in your area. And then those trees and shrubs would be uh, eligible for our uh, funding programs. So if you're, so that's kind of the programs in a quick nutshell, if you're, if you're in Red Deer County, that could be available to you. Uh, if you're not in Red Deer County, if you're a farmer or a rancher, uh, there is Alice in many Alberta counties. Um, the full listing is on a website www.alice.ca. Um, for example, Mountain View County and Lacombe County, two of our neighbors both have Alice programs. Uh, if you're from Clearwater County, they don't have an Alice program, but they have Clearwater Land Care, uh, which is very similar. And, and so they might have some funding there in that program. And if you're an acreage owner, there now is a green acreages program that's actually province-wide. Uh, the county has our own here in Red Deer County, but there's also now a province-wide program. And there's the website there for that. If you Google the Land Stewardship Center, uh, the, the website would come up there. Uh, I do want to stress that back to our programs, um, I was going over the what the programs look like currently in 2021. Uh, the programs do evolve and change over time. 
exactly what the program will look like in 2022 it hasn't been decided yet. Um, the, the best thing to do is uh, to, to contact me and, and uh, we can er, early in 2022 and, and we can uh, talk about what the program's gonna look like for 2022. But what you saw today is, is what the program looked like in 2021. There's my name and contact info there. Um, like I was saying, if you do want to apply for the funding, um, contact me early in 2022, or even contact me any time between now and, and then, and uh, we can uh, get you on a list and, and get you ready for that. Um, as you saw, there is, like Toza was saying, you know, this is the great time to do that planning side of things. And uh, now is a great time to do that planning. And there are some planning requirements that are essentially um, requirements to attack to be able to, to apply for our funding too. So uh, again, that's the, now's the time to do that. Um, I think that is, yeah, that's the last of the slides. Just brought up the questions there. Cody, if you. Yeah, Stephen has a question here. He's asking if the Green Acreages program is a one-time funding or can it be applied in multiple years? Oh yeah, you can apply uh, multiple years if, if you have different projects. Uh, quite often, we would even recommend that so you're not taking on more than more than you can handle at one time. See a comment from Terry, create advice there, Naturescaping, another excellent publication is Naturescape Alberta. Definitely, great resource. Okay, and I'm looking into the question and answer uh, area too. It looks like Toso's been answering uh, Richard's question about the best way to get rid of carriganas. Um, yeah, there is a, a challenge with mechanical or chemical removal of carriganas. They're they're just hard to hard to get after and re remove. So, uh, thanks for answering that. Toso, if there are any other questions, I know we've kind of met our time uh, from 6 to 7.30 and uh, we're pretty much on time, but if I do believe everyone will stick around for a couple more minutes if there are more uh, questions that come along. So I'll kind of leave it open for a, for a couple here. Oh, absolutely, Cody. Guys, come on, if you, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, as I said, I, you have a great staff in the Red Deer County and I give a kudos I, and I said I know Ken and Amy and Cody for a long time uh, you guys are very very privileged to have a, such a good people to work with on this so um, and they, the programs are awesome I, I wish that I have an Edmonton sense like this but nothing similar on uh, that, that sense so absolutely you guys use these programs and, and, and rely on your great staff that you have in your county and look from the local folks, you know, again, Terry is over there and uh, he did a marvelous job. So there's lots of good project that is already on the ground and already done um, very well. Excellent. Well, I'm not, thanks for, for that, Toso. Um, I'm not seeing any questions pop up, but I did have a couple on my mind, um, especially after a year like we've had this year when should we be doing our tree planting? I know this is in maybe the past month has been uh, great for our site prep if you were going to get into any, but should we be looking at a spring planting here or uh, fall planting with these trees and native shrubs? Um, Cody, I will just go on quickly. Uh, Yannicke, um, this must be a good Dutch name. I have a good friend that's named Yannicke. Uh, difference between eco buffer and native shelter boats. Eco buffer, is uh, much more focusing on the uh, uh, the eco uh, oh, sorry, shelterable is protection basically around the along along the farmstead. Eco buffer is much more in open field to try to connect the natural forest or enhance the natural field uh, with the uh, native trees and shrub species for the various again uh, reasons, and that could be pollination. Because don't forget, folks that lots of our agriculture crops are, we call it, it's a monoculture and having the natural forest and natural shrubs and wetlands greatly contribute to overall as a uh, agriculture ecosystem. So if you wanna put the eco buffer, it's 
uh, again, it's additional things to your on your open field or the field area, not away from your home and farms. Um, it's a very similar concept, but the difference is again is purpose is ecological. So it could be pollinators, it could be uh, uh, the, the diversity of the or, or the field and, and enhance the uh, ecosystem. Um, uh, shelter belts basically around the, around your homes. Um, you can apply same principle of site prep, planting, species of choice. Um, it's absolutely the same. It's just that sometimes it's just a matter of location. Um, go back to Cody. Cody, um, what we're noticing in the last, probably because of the climate change, we have a last four or five years, the uh, very cold and wet springs. And that delay the spring tree planting all the way uh, almost in the, uh, the June and, and uh, beginning of the June. Generally speaking, uh, spring uh, planting, it starts uh, second or third week in May and can last all the way till let's say July 1st. And that's so you still have a lot of times for those uh, uh, small uh, trees to be planted in that sense. Fall tree planting is you plant much more bigger caliper trees and the potted material coding. Uh, so with the spring, we don't know what this spring is gonna come. We have a horrendous drought. So even with the snow, what we have here today, still uh, all province under the, under the moisture deficiencies. So be prepared for the spring. If you're gonna plant, it could be a cold and wet spring. Uh, and by the end of the May, you might start, start planting. But make sure what is the summer that you have a water available in the case uh, that again we get a more drought in that sense. So uh, that water availability and what you're gonna do in the case that we got the drought. Um, you can plan all of those spring planting all the way probably till uh, end of the June, uh, and after that it's much more much more. Uh, it simply doesn't have enough time for the small for the small seedlings to be established in that sense. On the fall, it's for the bigger caliper trees. It's not for the small stuff. Uh, thanks, Toso. So the uh, another one we had here uh, about species. Uh, what best species to plant that wildlife would browse on the least? <laughs> uh <laughs> Uh, what kind of, uh, so I assume it's a deer and moose, and I don't know if you guys have an elk. That's, um, there is a, some of the wildlife, yeah, again, one of these kind of the buffalo berry, um, the most, uh, very few wildlife species going to browse. Um, it's part of the nature, so the, 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 of course, the, the moose, 80% uh, of the moose diet is the, is the shrub vegetation, mostly willow um, and young aspen and young balsam poplar. More, not balsam poplar, but young aspen and, and the willow that is most is going to be. Um, there are lots of times when you have around your homes, lots of people put a good fertilizer in water and it's a nice and succulent uh, species um, that, uh, that wildlife is going to browse. So um, wildlife management is, it has, an, you know, um, generally speaking, nothing to do with the tree species that you planted. It's, uh, it's a part of the nature. Uh, you might have a uh, hunting season or something like that, but again, it's a part of the nature. So there is not uh, some of the, uh, of course, spruce is not going to be uh, browsed. Uh, pine will be heavily browsed by the moose and deer. A moose cow almost has to get the pregnant. Uh, they have to eat something in the pine and, and it stimulates the pregnancy in the moose cow. Um, so conifers, except the pine, Pretty much, they're pretty safe. They are not going to be heavily destroyed as, as the other. Uh, most of the time, trouble are the the fruits that you have. If you have a fruit species that that uh, uh, angulates is going to go after. So it's it's much more angulate management than species what you want to plant. I'll just add, uh, Tozo. Um, quite often, if you do if you are building a fence for livestock, we might suggest maybe you can build a fence that uh, is kind of Going to help keep the livestock or sorry the wildlife out as well uh, a couple of the photos in my presentation um, showed a couple of different fences one was pretty much almost a wildlife fence and then the other one was a uh, i was using snow fence to see um to see if he could keep the the deer out of, of his newly planted shelter belt so we'll kind of see how that one works but yeah, uh, yeah so fencing is, is it's definitely not foolproof um but it uh, it, it can help 
I totally agree. Again, especially now with electrical fence, and you might use a solar solar panels or uh, supply electricity to that. It's definitely, and again, I've seen sometimes animals fence doesn't work or animal just doesn't care in some aspects. But it, I always said it's a part of the nature. It's a part of the way you where you live, and, uh, and 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 sometimes acceptance is is the best best way. Great idea from from Terry on how he's dealing with yes. buff deer. In the comments, sir. You, Terry, you have a lots of wildlife in your in your in your area, in your property. Okay, I got a Boyd Smith. Um, red maple trees. When you have the male leader die and have the two other branches form T, when it's the best time to prune um, that leader and it's uh, okay. Uh, uh, Boyd, um, you can prune that that uh, 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 branches anytime. Generally speaking, I would not prune them all the way to let's say um, uh, March. Uh, or maybe at the beginning of the April. The reason for that, if you prune them now, you're gonna have a wound and the whole winter and cold weather minus 40 is gonna go after that wound. Um, so wait for now, they are dead. So nothing you can do about that void, uh, but just wait probably till uh, March and April and then you, you prune them. With the maple, sometimes you have to let them almost, what, when I prune my silver maple, I usually prune in May or even in June. And the reason for that is they leaf out and I know exactly which branches are dead. And, uh, and they, because they, they, they have a tendency, same as a birch, they bleed. So they lose the water when you cut them in, in let's say in March and April, they lose the water and the tree try to heal basically. So I personally, uh, my uh, silver maple in my backyard die, they have a die back every year. And I usually go around June and end of the May then I prune them and, uh, and I know which one are dead and the new growth is coming back. So I hope that helps. Excellent, thanks uh, Toso. And thanks Terry for, um, for your solutions in the chat. <laughs> it is good one. Well, I think that might be it. I don't see any more um, uh, questions in the, um, chat or in the Q&A box. Uh, so I'm just going to thank our presenters uh, this evening. Toso, thanks for joining us. Your expertise is, uh, um, uh, we're lucky to have you uh, available to us and to present. And, uh, you know, as a resource, as we go uh, down the road here, we'll, we're never afraid to reach out to you and ask to get our questions answered. Uh, and Ken, if you, for anybody that is looking for, uh, tree planting project and it kind of fits the requirements uh, under these uh, programs. Ken is an excellent resource to help you uh, do some planning and you know potentially get some funding uh, so we can get more trees in the ground which is the goal here. Yep. So I appreciate all uh, of the attendees joining us today. There's some great questions. Uh, we will be uh, following up with you um, uh, sending you a link to our uh, website and that, and uh, we'll have this uh, recording stored somewhere so we can um, share it with you for a, a limited time. Thank you all guys. Again, thanks to the Red Day County. Thanks to Amy, Ken, and, and, uh, and Cody. And thanks also, Terry, for jumping in again. You guys, you rock. <laughs> Keep up with good work, folks. And plant those trees as much as you can. Good night, folks. Thanks, everyone. Good night.